quiet seaside town, an evil lain to rest centuries ago, has risen. An abandoned fortress deep in the swamp holds a secret that could save the village or destroy it. Now, a band of adventurers sets out to dig up the wounds of the past and bring the light of day to the roots of ruin. This is Tabletop Gold. friends and welcome to tabletop gold the roots of ruin is the name of the show it's episode 150 150 baby i'm lars castine welcome to the show it's a big number divisible by all kinds of things uh i'm lars i don't know if i mentioned that and i'm joined today as always by robin lang good that time good that time zoe chernikoff I'm so tempted to say good that time 150 times, but I don't want to make any of us live through that. So let's all just imagine and said that I did it. I could loop it if you wanted me to. I could Ooh. do like a, I could put a house beat behind it. We could make a dance track out of like. And that's our show. That Thank time. you for coming. Good that time. Yeah. Good that time. Good that time. I feel like we need that. We've earned that. 150 episodes in, we deserve a house beat good that time. I agree. Yeah. We should probably. I'll I'll see if I can whip that up. I'm going to do a terrible job at it, and it's going to take me very little time. Uh, that's Great. my promise to you. And my next <laughs> promise to you is I'm going to say hello to David the Tin Man Chernikoff. Hi, David. Hi. Thank you for doing that. Every time you do something fun audio with Zoe's voice, it always gives me a special kind of butterfly <laughs> flutter. <laughs> Uh, Come no for problem. the bow chicka wow wow. Stay for the oh, good that time. Yeah. Stop it, babe. <laughs> Let's hit the bow chicka wow wow. <laughs> bow chicka wow wow. We did it. Um, and yeah. also, our Matt Humphreys is here as well. Good that time. Uh, glad to be here. Glad to have you. David, we have a special conversation topic for episode 150. What What is it? What are we talking about this time? Yes, right. Um... I was thinking about this a couple of weeks ago as the milestone was coming up, and I thought it could be fun to um, put out there for people who are hearing the show, um, like things things about ourselves that if if have never come up on the show, but that right. like. Every anyone who has known us for as long as the show has been going on would typically know this th this thing about you, but just because of the nature of the show and the nature of the conversation and the fact that we mostly talk about food, but basically what's something that people who've known you for this long would typically know about you, but that listeners just w wouldn't would happen not to have have heard. Okay, so here's the thing, listener, that you don't know about Lars Castine. That is that I am six feet and six inches tall. I am very, Ooh. very tall. I weigh 250 pounds. I'm a large, tall guy. This camera, if you're looking at the video, this camera is ha hanging off of a, like it's just dangling from the ceiling. It's mounted like to the this. Eiffel right. Tower. You have 15 foot yeah. ceilings. Yeah. <laughs> yes. D David, did you say it was mounted to the Eiffel Tower? I did. Tower? That's what I said. That what yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a GoPro attached to the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. Uh, that's just how I, that's the only way to have made it, to make it work. So that's what we've been doing. So that's the thing about me. I'm really, really tall. We've covered, uh, you know, a, a related adjacent fact about you, which is that you have a, I gather, I didn't know this before we did the show, but an absolutely enormous noggin. Yeah, my head's very big, guys. Um, it's a sizable forehead that I've got up here. Speaking of tall people, um, something about me that you would that would probably come up if you saw me every week for three years, but that I don't think has come up on the show, or if it has, it's been only very tangential, um, is that I absolutely love NBA basketball and spend mm. an unusual amount of sort of downtime 
uh, in the world of the NBA. So a fair amount of that is listening to podcasts about sports, which are mostly about basketball, which is something that I do like when I'm doing chores or walking the dog or trying to fall asleep at night and not falling asleep at night. <laughs> um, so over time, and especially since having kids, um, when a higher and higher proportion of my free time has been devoted to doing chores and walking the dog and trying to fall asleep at night and not falling asleep. Mm -hmm. And like, if you hung out with me for three years, you would know that I uh, basically worship Zoe French fries and Steph Curry. And only two of those have come up on the show. <laughs> do the order right, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in some order. I I thought that Zoe French fries might be a basketball player for a second. I thought that that was <laughs> it's a, just her a pet, it's pet name for her. Really, that's that, right. That's also possible. Yes, yeah. Stephen Curry is the Zoe French fries of basketball players. <laughs> Does anybody else have have uh, anything for this? This is I I can't remember if it's ever come up or not. I don't know why it would have. Um, but people who know me and are just in person would know that. Um, my hair has not been my natural color for most of my life. Mm. Um, I look like a redhead very naturally because I have this very pale skin. And I was strawberry blonde as a kid. But then around age 12, my hair went to a very dull, mousy brown. And my sister took it upon herself to dye it. And my mother <laughs> actually liked it. And so my mother said, sure, you can keep doing that. Um, so I have dyed my hair since I was 12. Wow. Mm. Has it always been within a relatively narrow band of that sort of reddish color where you started? Or have you had like this six months it was electric blue and this six months it was, you know, bright pink and whatever? Um, I always wanted to dye my hair uh, something very wild. But because you have to bleach your hair before you put a lot of wild colors in, I didn't want to damage mm -hmm. it that much. So I've never done anything like blue. But I've definitely done pink over my hair because that works well with the red base. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, there was a stage in, in college, I had blonde hair at one point, and I also had very, very dark brown hair, like mm. deep mahogany. Mm -hmm. um, so I've tried both of, I've kind of gone all around You've to different dabbled. things. Anything that's not my natural color. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, so pink is the one I, pink is the one like non-natural that I go back to the more, most often. Cool. I love it. So, there's my fact. This is so enlightening. What a nice time. I'm enjoying this conversation. Well, who would like to go? Who would like to go next? So the one I can think of, I think if this would come up even now, if you knew me for three years, like sort of, sort of in the physical world, I have had, it's not like a, a lifelong hobby of, but since college, so, you know, being 24, a six year long hobby of visiting literary tourism sites and mm. famous people's graves. Ooh. So like if I go to a new city, I will try to learn if either or both of those things exist and, and make a sort of pilgrimage to do either or both. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One, um, have you ever been to Bath in England? And two, what is your favorite uh, literary place you have like gone and poked around? I So I went to Bath before I started this activity. I went my senior year of high school. So I, I didn't get to apply my sort of Jane Austen lens. I would love to go back. I want to go back to London and, at some point and, and do this too, because that, that. The, that was the last time I was in London. Um, so my favorite literary tourism spot I've probably ever been the, the two most interesting in the more tacky vein were um at one point I went up to Forks Washington where Twilight takes Ooh, place I know and that, this was I like know this would have been like 2011 so the series wow. was like you know this was not like I was yeah. but, but it has transformed that town like people have cardboard cutouts of Robert Pat or had cardboard cutouts of Rob uh, Robert Pattinson around. Like the whole town is like embodied Twilight, which is so weird to think about living in a town and having that happen to you. Yeah, like ha ha like choosing to lean into this. Um, and the other really fascinating place is Prince Edward Island. I grew up loving the Anne of Green Gables books. It is, I mean, like. There's the Green Gables house. Um, it is a major tourist and wedding destination for Japanese tourists in particular. There are a number Which, of Anne of Green Gables anime series. Uh, right, if right. In, yeah. Really? Yeah. I, I also totally. went to the Green Gables Heritage Site in Prince Edward Island. I actually made my now husband drive me there. We did a nice. whole long road trip. 
Um, and yeah, that was absolutely, I saw the same thing. Like more than half of the tourists who were there were Japanese and the whole island is all about Anne. Yeah. And anything is. Ellen Montgomery. Yep. Um, and the weirdest grave I've ever been to is Jack Kerouac's grave, which is in Lowell, Massachusetts, where someone had just set an entire stack of fresh pancakes. Yeah, that's... Uh... Hmm. So, you yeah. know, everyone... Curious you, that, why now. Yeah. Look, I'm going to say it. What a waste of good pancakes. You know? <laughs> He's not going <laughs> to yeah. eat them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's actually a pretty good segue into the answer I'm going to give, which is uh, not super exciting, but... Um, I have a huge sweet tooth. Like I just love sugary, ideally very carb heavy things. Um, uh, and I think there's two reasons for that. Um, the first one is I quit smoking cigarettes and (laughs) needed something else to, to, uh, consume. Um, and when I was in New York, um, when I joined this, uh, dojo, um, we, my friend, uh, Raina was like spending this time trying to perfect her, um, mother's, uh, ginger molasses cookies. Oh. And so she was, she was doing lots of like iterations of it. And so we all started baking and like bringing goods in every week. Uh, and it was just lovely. And, um, uh, I haven't done as much of it, um, since I moved out of New York, but, um, do Maybe you the have summer is the summer a favorite baked good, Armat? Ooh. A sweet baked good, a sweet treat. I do make a pretty mean key lime cookie. Ooh. With that sort of like Ooh. citrus glaze. I want it. Why can't I have it, Armat? Why don't you make me that? I it's next time party. I come to town, I will. Thank you. We'll have a cookie yeah. party. It sounds great to me. I I the cookie party is probably my favorite party. Yeah. Guys, uh, thank you for that. That was great, David. I love that topic. Thank you for uh, thank you for indulging me. And um, Zoe, that that was it's really cool. I have all kinds of questions about that. I had no yeah. idea you did that. Oh, stop it! <laughs> hey, it's episode one hundred fifty. I don't know if we've mentioned that. I'm going to do a, a real quick. That was a great conversation. So I'm going to fly through this uh, very quickly. I'm just going to talk about stuff that's coming coming out on Patreon. Tabletop Gold is maybe more than any other show that you listen to, community supported. So all of the stuff that I'm going through right now is stuff that exists because of community support. So thank you to everybody who um, who chips in and, and helps us out uh, doing production of these shows. But here's here's what uh, has been happening on our Patreon lately. We've been recording episodes of Film Debuff, which is our games movie show. We did one about The Green Knight, which is a very strange movie, and we had a very strange conversation about it. So you should uh, tune mostly in my for, fault for that. <laughs> That's for sure. It was nobody's fault, and also maybe maybe everybody's fault. Um, the conversation about The Green Knight followed the rough narrative structure of The Green Knight, which um, is too bad for everybody. <laughs> It was great. It was a great time. We've been doing The Goldmine. That's our companion show for this uh, for this podcast you're listening to right now. Behind the scenes stories, deep conversations about role playing games, some rules discussions, and more. It's a ton of it's a ton of fun. Recently, we put an episode out of Goldmine Rewind, which is our look back at earlier shows, earlier episodes of the show. David and I talked about the experience of being a new player in this sort of game, and we covered some of the events in episodes eleven through twenty. Very fun to return to those early shows. So so check that out. Um, and our Patreon is super simple. You chip in five bucks to get audio, 10 bucks to get video, and we have other levels where you can support us all the way up. Should I give a little preview of something coming up this week? Should I do that? Yeah. Should I give a little, give a little so. tease? This tease, coming give week. Tease. You got to give the tease. We're going to give the tease. You just tease the tease. We're going to tease the tease. We're, it's, this is what was You're talking about. Like orange pico or... This is what's called in the <laughs> television business a deep tease. And no. here's what's going to happen. This week, we're putting out the first of a special two-part series in which we play the game Fiasco. Okay? The game Fiasco, if you don't know it, is a rules-light, narrative-focused game that creates stories of ambitious, self-destructive idiots uh, blowing up their lives. The, the the stories that it creates are kind of in the vein of like a Coen Brothers movie. Uh, I whipped up a playset called The Kindred Diamonds that's inspired largely by the TV show The Righteous Gemstones. 
Um, so we, we've got a two part series. Part one is coming out this week. Part two is coming out later. I hope you enjoy it. It's the first time we've, we've been able to do like an actual play show on, uh, the Patreon. So it's kind of a big thing. So I'm teasing it. We got one last thing before we're going to move into our game. We're going to, we're, we're whipping through it. It's episode 150. Yeah. I don't know if anybody <laughs> said that yet this time. Um, <laughs> you, did. you did. It's basically marking another year of us, um, of making this show. So we are, as a thank you, going to do, we're going to do another giveaway. We have a copy of the new Monster Core book. If you want, you can enter a drawing to win that book. Go to patreon.com slash tabletopgold. There's a pinned post. It's totally free. You don't need to be a member or anything like that. And there's instructions for how to enter there. Go there anytime until the end of May 2024, and you can enter the contest. And you can win can Monster Core. Can I enter the contest? I don't have that book yet. I don't know. There's always like legal stuff where they're like, you can't, if you're not associated, um, I'm not a lawyer. I can't stop you from entering. I mean, I guess I could ask you not to. Um, <laughs> you could get a restraining order. I could get a restraining order. <laughs> Whoa. That seems extreme. <laughs> Maybe, uh, I don't know. Maybe we should. We'll talk about it. Zoe, I'd like to actually get some legal counsel from you. That's which right. would be cheaper, getting a restraining order or just getting Robin a second copy of the book? <laughs> just well, buying, just buying literally the book everyone who enters the contest a copy of the book. <laughs> um, so there you go. We're doing a little special uh, episode 150 giveaway to thank you guys for supporting our show. Uh, our listeners are the best and... Uh, just wanted to say thanks. So there you go. Okay, let's get into it. Let's play our game. Your search for the Star Watch team has turned up its first success. While rowing a stolen rowboat across a vast underground lake, you stumbled into the nesting area of a pair of chules, hulking crustaceans coated with anesthetizing poison. In the ensuing fight, your boat was destroyed, but on the shore, you spotted the immobilized form of Colton Murabi, the surly bruiser who acted, or sorry, who continues to, sorry, I'm spoiling. Uh, okay, here we go. He's dead. May or may not continue to act at some point as the Star Watch squad's muscle. Four members of the Star Watch team are still missing. The grunt Torpor Wedge, the magic user Bevrin Dralfo, the medic Bertie Graham, and the captain Margot Jensen. And also, your friend from the Otari Town Guard, Mark. Mark. Before we get into um, the next steps, like we just ended this combat, we're in the moments after the end of this combat against the Tools. Uh, I have to say a couple of things. One, we just broke off a new five, so everybody has all new hero points. We have a new set of hero point cards. Um, I want to give everybody experience points for finishing that fight. On your character sheet, you can enter experience points on the upper right-hand corner. That was a low difficulty encounter, so it is worth oh, 60 boo. experience points. 60? I realized, that's right, 60, you level up at 1,000. I realized hey, almost that there. I had a new lever of manipulating the feelings of uh, our players on this podcast upon dropping experience points into our show because I, I think of myself as a nice person in a lot of ways, <laughs> but the delight that I get out of having finished like an encounter that was like difficult for you guys and telling you that it was a low difficulty encounter... <laughs> Like it, 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 it warms my heart in a way that I like need to maybe think about and investigate why it brings me so much joy <laughs> to tell you that something <laughs> difficult is something that the game considers easy. It's not a good characteristic of mine, but it is a characteristic of mine that I find harder and harder to deny as like time goes on. So, I'll tell uh, you when you're gonna have time to reflect <sighs> on this, and that's yeah. when episodes 151 through 291 of this show are us <laughs> running the MLM back in town. Because what's the point of having these fights at 60 <laughs> experience points per fight? Um. So and well, for XP, we we <laughs> only get XP through encounters, right? No well, social it, stuff gets us XP. I there are if you complete other sorts of quests, you'll also get experience points. Maybe in a few moments you'll earn some experience points. How many magical crullers do we need to sell to get a thousand experience points? Um 
One chill cake equals 10 XP. One, yeah, that's what it is. It's a one to 10 <laughs> ratio that we've set up. It's in the rule book. I don't know why. Okay. It's weird. <laughs> all right. Well, we can um, go sell 100 of those and um, skip all this. Yeah, we're good. All this crab so egg nonsense. This seems an achievable Depends number, on, Now, is, is it about our up market or our down market who sells it? Mm-hmm. That's right. Ooh, this is using terms from economics that I don't know. Oh, so. not terms from economics. MLMs. Ah. Uh, <laughs> up, gotcha. Sorry, upline and downline, not market. Up, ah, upline, upline and downline. And downline. <laughs> yeah. So downline is the people underneath you in the pyramid? Exactly, and, yeah. Okay, I'm on Side board line. now. And you're always on someone else's downline. Down. I really hope yeah. that this podcast eventually involves us tricking each other into joining an MLM and just just <laughs> really <laughs> ruining things for ourselves. I hope that that's where this goes. It seems like yeah. the logical conclusion of all I, of this. Now, I agree. I am, you know, starting up my own new business that I think is going to be really lucrative if anyone wants uh-huh. to get onto the ground floor. I do. Go that's on. my favorite floor to get in on. <laughs> so. Okay, so we're picking up right at the tail end of this combat. We just had this uh, really wild moment where AO cast roaring applause on this chul, and then the chul got double double whammied by Mag and Isthen. Which, by the way, was exactly what you predicted would happen at some point when we had our level up conversation. Yeah, yeah. It's just too good. You have to, you must you do, it. do it. You must you do it. <laughs> yeah. So. We're picking up from the uh, from exactly that moment. Trill is underwater, having slipped underwater from casting a three action magic missile, or sorry, force barrage, and not swimming. Blah, 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 so blah, 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 blah. let's pick up from there. Trill is underwater, and Ao, Mag, and Isthen are all uh, immediately coming to terms with this fallen chul. So what do you do? Trill swims. Okay. Good choice. Okay. Yeah. She decides not to drown. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't prepared. I didn't fully prepare for other other options, but yeah. where we find I- out, Trill can't swim. <laughs> Ao seeing Trill sort of come back up to the surface and take a big gasp, leans over Colton Marabi to sort of take his pulse and see if he's yes. going to be able to start That's breathing again as well. That's where Mag starts as well. She would as if as soon as Trill's safe, she'd go straight to um, Colton. Yeah, so so Ao is is right over Colton, and you look him over. I'm not going to make you do a medicine check. Colton is sliced mostly in half, mm, uh, bummer. and is Ooh. partly eaten. Oh, as you if you nudge Colton over, you can see that his body has been positioned over two additional chul eggs. Mm-hmm. Mag spotted chul eggs attached to the underside of this dock that you guys are near, this this decaying pier. These chul eggs are are round, around the size of a of a human head, covered in brown and purple swirls. Mag spotted four of those underneath the pier, and there are two more under Colton's body. And for that, I'm gonna give you 10 more experience points for having done what you could do for Colton. If I wrap him in gauze, do I get 10 more? Each each revolution of gauze actually gets you negative five experience. Oh, okay. um, Put the gauze um, away, babe. Now, too logically, <laughs> too, too I, late. I feel like, logically, my brain goes to, we should probably destroy these eggs so that more of these horrific um, crab creatures don't come out. But at the same time, a different part of my brain says, can't just kill babies. They haven't done anything. Oh, interesting. I'm torn. That other part of my <laughs> this brain. This is Robin being torn. I don't know if Trill's torn. The other but... part of my brain wants to know if we could train them. Oh, <laughs> mine went to a totally different <laughs> place. I was going to see what kind of omelets they made. I was thinking food too. <laughs> nice. Yeah, totally. Slithery omelets. Oh, Trill um, swims over to the dock and climbs up the back of the chul to get up on the dock, by the way. <laughs> the back of the fallen chul. Is it clear to Mag that these are chul eggs? You've you've told us. Does Mag know this is us that? Is that because they're like very noticeably? I guess maybe once we see open chul eggs with little babies in them eating Colton, we can kind of tell. Yeah, I, I, I maybe jumped the I maybe jumped the gun on that. Um I I'd say 
whoever has the highest, what's the, our highest nature modifier in this group? Um, <laughs> got a zero? How's that? That's I seem to have an 11. Good. I don't know when that the happened. 12. <laughs> wild. Isthen. Isthen has a 12. Interesting. All right. So I'll say that, like, maybe Ao and Isthen are both feeling a little more comfortable in this area as it's becoming clear that, like, natural or aberrant... Actually, I'm sorry, these are aberrant creatures, so I'll say nature or occultism. But it's like you're here in a well, natural area that, like, nature and survival, skills that have maybe been, like, less than meaningful throughout this adventure are, like, potentially useful. Like... I don't know if this group feels, I was thinking about this the other day, like this group has not invested heavily into survival and you're deeply in a survival situation right now as you're trying to find these, you know, these missing people, like that's straight up survival. So, so My survival's not terrible. And I think okay. I'm actually the best in the party with a mm. one that's not terrible. That's all, that's the best I can say for it. Is it higher than one? Yes. <laughs> then you've got me beat. I've got 10. <laughs> at some point, I started trying it's to goose this a little. Higher than that. I'm at a, it's at 11. Okay. So. So, Could still fail a check on it. Yeah. So Trill and Mag have a little bit of a sense. But I'm going to say, with the, given that these are aberrant creatures, Trill is able to reach the conclusion pretty easily that these eggs are, are chul eggs. Okay. So um, no, no, no issues there. So yeah, I guess Mag um, can pop back down below the surface of the water to see, I, I guess, try to get a sense of what this nest is like or see if they can be dislodged and brought back up to the surface. Yeah. There's something I want to mention about the water that I haven't mentioned before. This water's gross. Um, okay. Like it's... Yeah, it's Trill knows that. It's Yeah. <laughs> Trill and Mag now are intimately familiar with various gross aspects of this water. You get the sense that if you were to um, to drink this water, it would not be great for your long-term comfort. Okay. Like when I went kayaking in the Potomac. Not great. <laughs> Don't do it again. Yeah. Roger yeah. that. Roger. Um, Mag also spots on the underside of this dock, um, in this sort of nest that the tools have created, in addition to these four tool eggs, there's like bric-a-brac stuff that they've gathered to to form into mm. this nest. Okay. And among that you find a fair amount of gold. Yep. Some silver mm -hmm. and a really nice looking long sword. It's a plus one striking long sword if anybody's yeah. interested oh. in that. Well done, Mag. Yeah, we love job, Mag Dorita. We love a new toy. Let's see. Can I just shoulder the sword? Without over bulking. I think you can. I think you're fine. Yeah. Oh, I sure am. Man, I'm a hefty girl. All right. Um, Mag will <laughs> uh, sheath the sword along with the rest of the arsenal she carries around on her back. Okay. So I'm I'm tossing the sh the sword into your into your inventory. These oh. tool eggs, you're able to put just a little bit of elbow grease in, and they detach, and you. You pull these purple brown eggs off pretty easily, and you on the rocky shores of this lake now have six chul eggs. Is there any sort of like recall knowledge we can do on these to know if they're like how soon they'll hatch, if they're good for anything? Can we sell them? Can we eat them? If they are good, if they're gonna hatch, I think that. Seeing how big these tools are, seeing these eggs, you take a look at them. It doesn't seem like their hatching is is imminent. This doesn't seem like it's an immediate threat. Like you don't you don't see a likelihood of a tool swarm or anything like that emerging from the uh, from the from the eggs. Will if, an egg suffocate if put into the bag of holding? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think that eggs respirate. I think that that seems like a reasonable uh, thing to do. The uh, if they hatch, though, that's maybe a problem. Then they would perhaps might suffocate. Your next question was what they're used for. How can we benefit from them? Is what I'm really. Asking. <laughs> How can you question. benefit from them? Somebody give me. Can I give you society? This is going to be a very very high uh, DC, but somebody 
I'll take like a I'll take like a society. Yeah, can I give you society? That I'll feels... take a society. Yeah, give me a blind society, okay. please. Can I aid? Sure. Ao and Mag sit down and start thinking like, what could we do with these things? You want blind, right? No, not for the aid. The aid I can get out in the open. What if it's an embarrassing number? I don't know. What if? What's the number? Three. That's a three? What is... what? F- Fifteen total. Oh, okay, that's a success. So you'll add oh. one to Mag's check. All right. You're welcome. Thanks. And what that role means is that you believe that chul eggs might be considered a delicacy in some civilizations. All right, so we failed that. <laughs> um, okay, okay. So Colton was sitting was sitting bisected over two eggs, but those eggs were not hatched and eating him. He was he was just kind of like high. They, they were just like concealing warming them. Eggs. Yeah, warming them. They made a nest in him. Hmm. Yeah, let's bring him with us. What could go wrong? That would explain the long sword in the nest below. Okay. If, oh, right. All right. Well, Mag. Maybe they I, put their. They make nests out of people for their eggs. This feels like maybe ooh. something else cut him in half. And then he was just dragged was... dragged over here by the chul. After that is sort of the. I mean, they've got the big the... long pincher things. They could slice them. That could go either way. But the way. sword feels like maybe someone used that. I that could have come from another adventurer. You'd be able to tell from looking at the body whether it's a sword or a claw that cut him. We look at the body. Is it a sword or, <laughs> or a claw? It's a. It's definitely a claw. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's that tarantula from floor two. <laughs> okay. that you ah, promised yeah. us we weren't going to have to fight. <sighs> it's back. It's back. All right. All right. Well, it Mag me. will uh, um, me. Uh, very carefully load the six chul eggs into the chul egg compartment of the bag of holding which has been there for a while and she was really wondering what it was for okay so the bag of holding now has six eggs of the subterranean crab monster called the chul nestled inside of it let me describe your immediate surroundings if i may please You're standing on this rocky beach in a hazy underground cavern. There's a decaying pier leading into the water to the north. Your visibility is limited by haze floating over this lake. To your left, you see a number of cages. There's one in the distance that has another chul. There's one right next to you that has this large alligator-like, dog-like creature that was barking, which seems to have quieted down. Past those cages, there is another shore that you could, from here, can probably tell connects back up to the piers that you initially started your investigation on this floor from. There's Also, to your immediate northeast, a cliff about 20 feet up over the water that is right next to a small waterfall that you hear burbling to the the north. And then behind you to the south, there's a door. This door looks water damaged and wooden. and that's that's about what you're able to see here. Uh, show me where the door is on the map again. Sure, the door is right next to Ao. Okay. Down there. Um. Well, I th- I think for Mag's part, casting off on that boat, going around this edge of the chamber, briefly climbing up on that tall rock to like get a vantage of the area and try to see what could be seen of all stems back to trying to assess or kind of um, 
whatever, investigate, diagnose what happened to first one and now two members of the Star Watch who ditched us this morning and came up here and apparently <laughs> just wandered into the into the danger chute and got themselves killed. I heard that was uh, Kenny Loggins's uh, original. Wander draft of the song. through the danger chute. Dang, 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 yeah. Um. So, uh, I mean, th these doorways are certainly tempting as part of the story there. We've started um, exploring outside and we found two bodies so far. So I guess it looks like, is there any more of this chamber off to the east or have we found the edge of it? Because I can see it looks like working back to the west and eventually to the north would bring us back to where we started. Looks like we can still see kind of yeah. the original pier that we started on off to the northwest. So have we have we like hugged the eastern wall enough or is there more chamber off to the east? I'm honestly kind of interested in that door knowing that Colton died just in front of it. So like like someone could have survived and gone through that door to get away. Yeah, I mean compelled by the fact that there's dead bodies in the chamber, compelled by there's the fact that there's doors to open. Um so up for David, whatever. I want to. But yeah, so, what's the so answer the to the answer, question? Yeah, the answer to your question is that you're at the eastern edge of this lake, at least from what you can see. But you you can see that this cliff, twenty feet up, like is a break in the cliff wall that extends all the way up to the top of the cavern. So it's like most of the stone of the rock wall that you're looking at goes all the way up, mm. except this cliff. Uh, looks like it does extend further east, but into potentially smaller caverns off yeah. to the east. Yeah. So many caverns. And it's a and it's a twenty foot climb um from the water and there's a waterfall there. So it's not it's not gonna be the easiest thing to get to get into. Yeah. All right. Well uh I guess Mag would wanna before before going in, Mag would want to take a quick jog off to the west of where we are there's like a corner that we can't quite see around and just peep around that yeah. corner and see if there's any uh you know cadavers what have you so that jog is going to be a swim okay um that's going to be a swim that you're going to have to thread the needle between at two of these cages the mm. everything between you and this beach to the west is like a sheer cliff face just going straight down into the lake. I see. I see. So you have to swim over there and then climb up. I just want to clarify. This beach to the west, this is water level. This is a beach. Okay. Over to the east is a 20-foot cliff. Oh yeah, I'm saying over to the uh, over to the west. Well then, great. Let's swim over to the west and provided there's okay. a way to do that without being in reach of the um the big creatures, I think just taking a quick peep down here to the southwest along this beach before we go inside. Is everybody else going with Mag, or are you staying behind? I was imagining while Mag was doing that, Trill had her ear up to the door yeah. to see if she heard anything behind. She's basically, like, waiting for Mag to say whether or not to come over that way. Yeah, no one else to needs to see if she can tell come on else. the swim, I don't think. I agree. So, do, Mag... Do you want me to join you? No? Oh, you're good. Oh, all right. Perfect. Yes, yeah, see if you can fix the boat. Ao just, just gently levitates Colton's uh, half leg torso body uh, four inches off the ground and lets it fall oh down. Man. Pick it up, let it fall down. Oh. Oh, you <laughs> get the intestines all dirty. <laughs> so Mag swims across to the west, and and yeah, these cages look very sturdy. Whoever it is that built or maintains these cages seems to work pretty hard on making sure that they keep these creatures inside of them. Mag is able to swim right past uh, this large, I'll show you the art one more time, this large, like, alligator-like, dog-like creature with spikes on its tails and, and some nasty-looking teeth coming out of it. Let's see. Ayo wants to see, get, see those teeth closer. Yeah, good teeth. Can Isten recall knowledge about that creature at mm -hmm. some point? Sure you could. Um... Isthen taking a look at this creature as Mag swims by. Can I have a blind nature check, please? Yes, indeed. Isthen recognizes this creature as something called a Kruth. 
Crews are also known as crocodile eaters. They're, uh, they're, they're hunters, they're predators that live in swamps, in bogs, and so on. They will eat basically anything, but they most enjoy eating lizard folk, boggards, and dinosaurs. Do you have a question you'd like to ask me about this creature, Armin? Um, yeah. Does it have any immunities? It doesn't have any immunities. This is a, a natural creature. There's no kind of magical anything uh, surrounding it. So, so this this creature just kind of is as it does. Okay, cool. That's good to know. Thank as you. Mag finishes this swim between the the cages, she finds herself. Uh, she's able to climb up and stand on this rocky shore. She is able to see that there are more cages. Uh, positioned all over this beach. It's like this beach has been like a staging area for collecting these creatures, presumably from around the swamp. Mag looks up to the north and sees this hulking skeletal creature that you saw when you first came down to this level. She sees another creature like that uh, down to the south, nestled between two rock walls, uh, this one not in the water. She sees the Kruth immediately behind her. She sees another chul to the, uh, to the north in, a, in an aquatic cage. So Mag is essentially standing on this rocky beach, five cages, four of them containing enormous creatures. I'm wondering if Mag has any idea about what is happening That is here. exactly what Mag wants to know. And, and it sounds like these are well you're just the way you're describing it makes it seem like these are things that have been gathered from the natural environment and sort of whatever hunted and uh and caged up what can swamp lore tell me about what it is that i'm looking at um i'm not going to make you do a check okay. um what swamp lore tells you is that like you know mag has spent enough time around swamps to know that there are uh, she's she's probably known people that have done this that that do trapping that do that that set traps for things put them in cages maybe for pelts that kind of thing. You don't know exactly what these creatures are being stored for, but it seems as though they have been collected and stored in cages here. You don't see, I'll tell you, any sign of any additional Star Watch members here, but you do see that. As you hold your, your wayfinder up, it looks like there's a small passageway leading off to the southwest. You know, so now we have three doors, one each by the two dead bodies. Well, I guess we're over here. So, um, I mean, it's like if we're going to go inside, we could go inside back by the by the pier where we where it seems like the fight happened. Uh, rather than yeah, going makes in sense to me. side door. So yeah, let's let's uh, let's do that. Let's head back to the start and um, go in the door up there. When you say the start, do you mean the original location or the one that we started with this episode? The, oh, I was thinking the original one, but I'm certainly not going to this third door down here to the thing. Um, yeah, I figured the one that we're near right now kind of makes sense at least. Okay, let's do that. Mag jumps Easy back time. in the water and swims back to the pier. Oh, I, I, I should mention, we did we rolled some uh, healing checks, some medicine checks um, off uh, microphone. So all of uh, this exploration that we just talked through is happening sort of alongside AO, patching up everybody and getting them back in ship shape. It takes about an hour to recover from this combat and to explore the surrounding area. So an hour, by the and time, I think minus 500 experience points, right, from all the gauze wrapping? That's right. Oh you're no. now level you're level six now. I'm so sorry. Oh, well. Shit. 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 That's how it goes. Shit. Fair call. Damn. Shit. So as you're preparing to open this door, would you please tell me what sorts of exploration activities you might be doing? Are you searching, scouting, investigating, trying to hide? What are you doing? Uh, Mag is scouting uh, for enemies. is scouting and looking for okay. traps. Okay. Isthen is searching. Trill, I guess. What is she usually doing? Searching? Yeah, Probably. that sounds right. Mag scouting puts her ear to the door, doesn't hear anything behind it. 
but you do feel the sort of wet, soggy door brush across your cheek for a moment as you listen at the door. Um, <laughs> all right, a nice wet ear. Uh, Mag wipes yeah. her ear off yeah. and um, opens the door. The door opens into a hallway. The hallway is uh, ancient seeming, ancient stone carved into the side of this cave. Uh, there's rubble around the floor and you hear the echoes of your footsteps reverberating around this stone floor as you step into the hallway. You see another door to the south, but you also see a hallway uh, like extending off in another direction off to the west, about 30 feet away from you. All right, um, let's head down the hall and maybe down here to wherever it tees. So you walk down this hallway and you come to the T and you see that there is a door leading off to the west and a door leading off to the south. Both of these doors seem to be in better shape. Um, the door to the west looks like it has perhaps seen less use recently than the door to the south, but both of them seem relatively, uh, relatively lightly traveled. Um, we'll go south. Okay. I believe that's clockwise. Uh, and you're still scouting, right? Yeah, yeah. So Mag presses her ear to the... Uh, door to the south. And you hear some faint murmuring on the other side of the door, along with a kind of like crickly, crackly sound. And you pick up a kind of smoky aroma in the air as well. Okay. Um... Well, love a good barbecue. Uh, let's open the door. How long does my cloak last? Uh, I don't know. Let's look at the item. Thinking, um, I'm thinking of getting invisible, everyone. Giddy up. Heck yeah. Looks like invisibility will make you invisible for 10 minutes. But if you do something hostile, it'll break the invisibility. Interesting. Well, I don't know. Let's do it. You know, what? What? what is the point of AO if not making impulsive decisions that may or may not be useful strategically? 100%. Some would say that's what this whole game is about. That's um, right. Arguably. A okay. AO looks at everyone and whispers, I'll see y'all out there, and winks and pulls her hood up and <laughs> disappears. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you push the door open and move into this room, and there is a haze of smoke filling the air that has a pungent smell but it's not it's not bad really and that smoke is coming from a large copper cauldron on the eastern side of this room it's uh it's on coals on a dais and there's a metal rack over this cauldron that holds several brown and purple eggs each the size of a human head. Mm -hmm. Someone's growing them. It's hatchery. Someone is cooking them. Or they're them. cooking them. Someone's cooking them. They are cooking, and you hear this, this pungent smell is smoke coming off of these eggs. And the walls all around this room are painted with sweeping lines and whirls like the eggs that you see cooking or being smoked on this cauldron. There are also six creatures here dressed head to toe in black. They're kneeling in meditation. Their noses are turned up in the air, appreciatively taking in the musk of these eggs smoking above the base. Crab egg cult. <laughs> they turn towards you. And make friends. And you see that they have 
sunken eye sockets. They're impossibly thin with bright white opaque eyes. They see the light shining from your like magic light spell as you enter the room and they go <sharp inhale> the one closest to you hears the doors open and shouts out in undercommon sisters brothers death comes whether their blood or our light whatever is spilled today will show our devotion to Earthagol. And the rest of them shout out, To Earthagol! <coughs> and they stand Earth-a-gol. up. Earth-a-gol. And they swivel towards you to fight. Ah! And roll for initiative. Yeah. 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 Roll for initiative. I'm going to roll stealth. I was going to ask before we even got there, if because you'd mentioned before that we could tell the eggs were valuable to some uh, to some different cultures. Do we ha- did we have any specific examples of who found those eggs valuable in our knowledge bank? Um, the Yeah, you got the sense that people eat them in galt. Mm. <laughs> we explain <spliced> accents? Très <laughs> bien. Yeah. Is that called Le ouf. Mm. Le ouf. Um, I, I believe I do have a free action before anything else happens. Oh, sure. Let's go. Let's do it. Right, Let's this doesn't it doesn't because it doesn't matter um, order at all. Um, Trill lets out a fearsome as possible cry as they all turn towards them um, to do her battle cry. All right, let's uh, get a battle cry. Let's get a demoralize from Trill, uh, and then we'll run through so the I'll initiative. Choose the guy who's closest to us to demoralize, uh, and let's pull that up. Let's see how this works out. That is a 34. 34 is a critical success. You see this this creature in front of you, this humanoid, uh, as they stand up and pull this knife on you, they flinch back as they hear this terrifying chord and they are now frightened <laughs> too. Y'all. Nice. Okay, let's oh, yeah. go around the horn and see how everybody did on initiative. Robin, how did Trill do? Uh, Trill did okay. Trill got a 20. I think okay. actually it's not really that good for her. So, eh. um, maybe so distracted by screaming in this dude's face. <laughs> I'll take it. Okay, Zoe, how did uh, Ao do with her uh, stealth initiative? Twenty-two, kind of middling, also. Okay, David, how did Mag do? It's a twenty-five for Mag. Okay, Mag seems ready for this. Fastest, I believe, of the group. How did Isthen do? Also sort of middling to bad. Uh, he got a 20. Okay. I think he was enchanted by that uh, exotic smell emanating from the uh, campfire. Yes. So as this fight breaks out in this hazy, bizarre worship chamber, the first of these cultists turns, sees Trill, or let me rephrase that, doesn't see Trill because he is blinded by this um, by by the light that you have. It's like the light is, is blinding him. He has the blinded condition. So it is going to be tricky for him to get close to you, to you or to do any damage, but he is a zealot, so he's going to try. He kneels down, lunges forward at Trill, and does a quick double slice with... A pa- with a pair of short swords. Here is the first of those strikes. So I needed to roll a flat check to attack you. The flat check I pass. I roll a 15 to hit you. That 15 is a critical miss. Um, you know what? I don't know if it makes a difference, but... <laughs> I think it does make a difference because I, no, I rolled a two. Okay. Then the second uh, short sword flies out towards Trill, again, making a flat check. I fail the flat check, a two on a DC 11 flat check. So he just swings wildly in a completely different spot than where Trill uh, is. Um, And I seem to have positioned him in the middle of a pillar. So I'm going to put him somewhere else. 
It is now Mag's turn. Mag yeah. sees this uh, sees this first cultist lunge forward at Trill. At the end of that cultist's turn, they're no longer blinded, but are now dazzled instead. And Mag gets the sense that there's some opportune time to strike quickly while these uh, these people are are unable to fight effectively because of their blindedness. What is Mag going to do? Just to be sure, sorry that we understand the geography of this room. These black circles, these four black circles are pillars, right? Yes. They so seem we cannot to be... move through those. Correct. Okay. So what's Mag going to do? Well, Mag can see that Trill is just about ready to start playing her tunes, uh, which usually help Mag out early in a fight. So she's going to delay just a moment and see if that gives Trill a chance to jump in first. Okay. I'm going to pull you down past Trill on the initiative tracker. And that means that it is Ao's turn next. Ao's going to do the same. She's going to go after Meg. Okay. So both... Ao and Mag delay past Trill, which means it is now Trill's turn. Trill, you see your companions standing by waiting for you to do something. What will you do? I think I'm going to do the thing. You're going to do the thing? You're going to harmonize? Gonna... Yeah! Right. So, oh, yeah. but according to the math, because harmonize is his own action, mm-hmm. and then casting a, uh, a, a composition is another action. Mm -hmm. To do lingering composition, that would be a third action. It's a free action. Right? Oh, lingering lingering comp's a free action. That's what it is. So the math does work out. The math math math. Focus points. Okay. So Trill begins by harmonizing. First action. Okay. Second action is going to be to cast Dirge of Doom. Okay. And she's going to place the locus of that Dirge of Doom further in because she already has that one um, guy in front of her. Um... Done, okay. so she's going to kind of I center got, it more. You know what I mean? I, I, I do know what you mean, but I have to tell you, the locus of the spell is you. Oh, the locus of the spell is me. Yeah, yeah. How it's far you does it go again? 30 feet. It'll oh, 30 hit feet. everything okay. in this room. Perfect. That's fine. Um, yeah, so let's. Uh, is the spells range enough that it will freak out the eggs that are being grilled? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These eggs are. Flipping out, man. Uh. These, these, these eggs are so high right now, guys. <laughs> All been there. Um, oh, because it says place 30 foot emanation, but. Yeah, uh, it, emanation uh, means from go. you. Great. Like, so, kind of always. Okay, so there's our first and second action of Dirge of Doom. So the other five guys should all be frightened one now. And that guy closest to Trill is still frightened too. That's right. Until the one? until the end of their turn, they will be frightened too. Fabulous. So then, for Trill's next action, she's going to do the free action of versatile performance. Not versatile performance. Sorry, that's the wrong thing. Of her lingering fortissimo. Sure. As it says in our thing here, and then with that one, she's going to do courageous anthem to give everyone a nice boost. All right. And that was a 35. So that's a critical success, meaning your friends are going to be getting a plus one to all their stuff for four rounds. Ow, Big time turn from Trill. Trill, <laughs> Trill, let it be known that Trill did the thing. Anybody who says that Trill didn't do the thing is a liar. They'd be wrong. They'd be uh, wrong. And should be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> but oh, that was the, fun. It, is, it is fun. It's fun to have fun. Um, but you know what else is fun? Is that it is now the turn of those who delayed it. Either Mag or Ao get to go. Who's gonna go? I feel like the landscape has really has really tilted uh, against Lars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, probably. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Mag um, will now step into the fray. I really want to get to the center of the room. There's no way to do that without passing by one of these um one of these little knockoff chalky Vadims. Could you tumble through? Yes. Is tumbling through an action or does it just slow down my range? Uh, tumbling through is an action. It's an acrobatics check versus uh, your opponent's reflex DC. It is not something that Mag is good at. Nope. Yeah, we're 
trail is weirdly better at tumble through it. Yeah, which <laughs> acrobatics has not been a focus. Um, Maybe some ballet would help. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I still want to do it. I just want to run into the middle of the room and start hitting stuff. So mm, makes sense. let's try it. Okay, I'm going to try and tumble through this super freaked out um, cultist who's right in front of us. And that's a crit fail. So how badly do I eat it? Ooh. You just don't get past them. You just don't move. Okay. That's it. Cool. Well, that was a fun action. Um, it was. Now I'm Sorry. going to hit that person uh, with a hammer, <laughs> which is a little bit How more my that? thing. Because <laughs> Mag's mad at them. It makes so sense. mad. I would, actually, you know what? I don't. I didn't. Wasn't going to do it this turn. But let's say that that misadventure causes Mag to rage. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really want to use the action, but it just it just seems more reasonable. Right. Uh, all right, and now. <laughs> It's a one on the die. Hero oh, no. it, it can't get worse. <laughs> Do you have two hero yeah, points? Yeah, we just, just reset the hero points, up. right? Okay, I'm I'm gonna hero point that. <laughs> okay. All right, that's a little more reasonable. So 28 to hit. That 28 definitely hits. Nearly a crit as you feel your hammer bash into this oh, creature. So these are this dude. These are these are tiny little boys. All right, that's 27 damage. 27 points of damage. You see that this this uh, light blinded creature is uh, very badly injured by that strike. As he goes <clears throat> and uh they shout back Spill your light, brothers! Spill your light! And that is it for Mag's turn. That means it's Ao's turn. I'm gonna let Istin go. It is Istin's turn. Alrighty. Uh, Istin is going to line up on the idiot in front of him <laughs> and uh, make a spell strike at him. Okay. Uh, he is going to use needle darts. A needle dart spell strike. Mm. Yes. And the way I'm imagining it is he like cracks his staff across them and then it turns into a like burst of needle flechette. Um, cool. And I really hope I don't miss now after getting so excited about that. That's, hope, that's the game. That <laughs> that's the whole thing. <laughs> you got to get yourself really excited about something that might be extremely disappointing. Mm. All right. Uh, so a 34 to hit. That is an easy critical hit. Uh, Istin is able to very easily find a weak point on this all black clad, uh, cultist and does a, pro how much damage? What are we looking at? Uh, that's 59 damage. 59 damage is, Don't uh, including the crit from the bludging and the uh, piercing from the needle darts. And don't you also have that crit specialization where you knock the target? Uh, I do In indeed. A forced yeah, move? I, would you like uh, to do that? I can knock him. Up. I'd love to do that. I would okay. love to knock him ten feet in a straight line away from me. If he so, hits one of his buddies, does that then? Well, I'll tell you what happens. Isthen pushes pushes this guy ten feet away from him. And he flies back and he says, the light comes. And he flies across the room, slams into one of his friends. And then in a 20 foot emanation, which is enough to hit all of you. Here goes. He blows up and does 5d6 <laughs> fire damage as light oh rips through his body and starts burning all of you apart. So 15 points of damage, fire damage, as this light rips out from this creature, and I need everybody to please make a reflex save. There's a lot of creatures hit by this, as this, it's essentially a fireball, tears through this room, hitting the rest of them, and also you, except somehow Ao, who is behind a pillar in such a way that they are, they are shielded from this from this emanation. That's what Foundry says. I'm going to follow that because it seems fun. I feel I'm like not the sure cloak that's is helping. I don't, I'm sure that's, you know, 
vibes, I, but... I agree. So, I need to know from each of you what your role was. Uh, Armet, what did Istin roll? Uh, 19? So that is a success, so you will take half of that 15 points of damage. Okay. Trill, uh, Robin, what did Trill roll? Apparently, Trill rolled a one on the die for a 16. So that is double damage. You take 30 points of damage. And David, what did Mag roll? It's a 20 on the die for Mag, so crit success. Okay, so no damage to Mag. The rest of them start taking damage too as this fire rips through them and it's it becomes clear to you as they start to laugh that they are happy about what is happening to them. They are thrilled at the chance of shedding this light all over the room. And we will pick up from there next time. They're, uh, they're sous vide the eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. The Roots of Ruin is a tabletop gold production produced under the Paizo Incorporated Community Use Policy using trademarks and copyrights owned by Paizo that are covered under that policy. Paizo does not recognize, endorse, or sponsor this project in any way, and we are expressly prohibited from charging you to use or access this content. For more information about Paizo Inc. and Paizo products, visit paizo.com. All original characters and content in The Roots of Ruin are the property of Tabletop Gold, and all rights are reserved. We at Tabletop Gold would love to hear from you. On our website, tabletopgold.com, you can learn more about us and our shows, pick up great merch, and connect to the best online community in all of podcasting. Thanks for listening.